no, I'm, I'm waiting on you, man. It's your show. I'm, I'm here for you. It doesn't feel like it sometimes. <laughs> I know, but it yeah. should. Not when you're I mean, your name's on the on the door. Yeah, that's that's how we know that it's yours. Can I have your permission to start the interview? Would you please start the interview <laughs> at your leisure? So I've been living out of my truck since 2008. You know, in a truck with a dog for 15 years, give or take a little bit. I know a little about a lot of shit and a lot about a little shit, but I don't know everything about anything. That's a surprise to me. I know. Because you carry yourself like you know fucking everything. Well, that's but. kind of the goal, right? <laughs> There's a group of guys in the Navy, they're, they're called SEALs, and you should never even consider <laughs> that. I always wanted to be a point man. Yeah. Like, that was my dream job in the teams. And I started as a radio man, and then I was a 60 gunner. And I looked down, and my legs, I'm just fucking pouring blood out of my leg. What a fucking shit show. Well, we can't afford to get a plane. Wow. Thanks. Tip of the spear. Nothing but the finest for my boys. Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. It's actually coming back to the podcast. True. Spent 16 and a half years on active duty, five deployments between SEAL Team 8 and SEAL Team 3, two of which I was on with him. Well, He's got a Navy com with a V for vagina, I mean valor. He's got a presidential unit citation. He's a the, puck. He's the owner of SH9 Outdoor Shop. He's the author of Go Fuck Yourself, a cautionary tale slash memoir about <laughs> sex toys and the dangers of prostate massage. He's the curator of dangers? himself. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Shane Hyatt. Yay! Blaine Wyatt. <laughs> so, uh, what's the last full book that you read? Uh, the fourth book of. You say Wheel of Time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Fucking yeah I'm, I'm, I'm in it. I'm in it right again. this minute. I read it every. Well, I read it almost every year. Yeah, the whole series. Man, what, what's the total time that it takes you to read the entire series, it usually? It depends on where I'm at. If I'm at the house, it takes a long fucking time. But if I'm on the road, I, I do a lot of reading on the road. And it's in a Kindle, so it doesn't take that long. So, I mean, what's a lot of time versus not a lot of time? Uh, 17 books, and they're full novels, probably two months on the road, and four, four and a half. So, like, house. almost half the year you, you read that no matter what. I mean, do you Most read years, a lot of other books otherwise? I, I don't. Really? No, I, I, I should. Okay, outside the Wheel of Time series, what's the last A Sword of Truth. <laughs> An S word of truth? <laughs> the fuck is that? Uh, it's another uh, uh, fantasy fucking <laughs> it's it's a fantasy. series. Okay. All right. third, third time's a charm. What's the last <laughs> real fucking book that you read? <laughs> Jesus uh, Christ. <laughs> you knew that's. You knew we were going to go here. Yeah. Um, the last full book I read, legit cover to cover, was a hardback copy of uh, Fingerprints of the Gods, Graham yeah. Hancock. Okay. Well... Not, that's a good start. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, what's well, that's not a start. That was the third time was the charm. I mean, it's a good start <laughs> in terms of just, you know, uh, an actual book that right, yeah. you know, isn't uh, some weird fucking dream. When's the last time you got laid? Uh, August of 12. That is refreshingly honest. Yeah. August of 2012. 2012, yeah. All August. Right. Yes. Uh, who's your favorite Marvel character? <laughs> Just skip right over that one. <laughs> wow. Uh, Deadpool. Is that considered a Marvel character, really? I yeah. Mean, is it? Yeah, that's Marvel. All right. Yeah. Uh, well, so I'm, I'm trying to bounce between total bullshit questions and deep questions. Okay. Why, why do humans exist? Uh, why do you think that they exist? Like, why are we here? Is uh, it an accident? Yes. Is there, is there some... Nah, there's no grand design. No, none, none whatsoever. No. It's simply a matter of uh, the proper sequences of DNA like in joining together and, and evolution and the hierarchy of nature. Total, total mistake. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I guess I, I bet I know the answer. I'm, I'm sure we've even talked about it, but um, do you think that there are other human beings in the universe? Human beings? That might be a stretch, but other intelligent life, I can't imagine that there's not. So to me... Uh, I mean, and probably considerably more intelligent life, all things I don't know. considered. I, I mean, to me, like if, like, so if, if, we, if we say that your theory of it's a total mistake is, is an accident, if you look at, you know, the, the natural elements that exist in the universe are pretty constant, you know, at least to our knowledge, which right, right. granted is, 
yeah. skewed to begin with. But Agreed. Uh, to me, it would only make sense if if that mistake was able to be made. Like mathematically, it could it could and and probably would be replicated again. Right. So I, I mean, to me, like if other legit life form exists, I think a lot a lot of people want to assume that it's some totally fucking weird, no pun, alien tech. You know, right, like, yeah. way outside the realm of well, the idea of carbon based or silicone based or whatever the base is. Yeah. It, it all has to do with, to your point, the the consistency of what we understand the elements that make up the galaxy. Right. Or the universe for that matter. Yeah. But there's too much of it for there not to be some other facsimile of what we are. Yeah. Another, I, there's a part of me that, uh, that believes that maybe we're the cautionary tale of the universe. Everybody knows we're here and they drive by and they're like, no fucking way. We don't want that infecting our shit because we're smarter than that. And they move on. I don't know. I mean, I think humans, like, there's a shitload of flaws, but you think about the brilliance behind a lot of things that exist. Mm -hmm. To me, and to me, like it, it's, I think fun to joke and be like, yeah, I bet aliens are like, fuck that place. But <laughs> there's a lot of cool shit here. There like, is to be fair. I mean, there is no doubt. I, you know, I think life's pretty awesome, but uh, do you think that the universe keeps going? Like what's your, what's your take on, on how it exists? Do you think it's a, a, a sphere that repeats? Like what it's the, uh, there's a the multiple universe theory and the the fabric of the universe. You know, they look at the the different scans of the universe, infrared, and all the different ways that they can view the light that exists, and it creates a pattern, kind of like the pattern in a leaf. You know, the the webs in a leaf, or the veins in your hand, or your fingerprints. And I don't know, maybe maybe there is an infinite number of those, and and an infinite Maybe we are all there is. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Why don't you know that? I, I, there's a lot I don't know. You've been around way longer than I have. You should I, know I, this I shit. I have. I mean, there's some shit I know that you don't, but... <laughs> uh, crazy. I know a little about a lot of shit and a lot about a little shit, but I don't know everything about anything. Yeah. That's a surprise to me. I know. Because I mean, you carry yourself like you know fucking everything. Well, that's but. kind of the goal, right? <laughs> You're, if, you, if you present con, you know, confidence, you... Yeah. you you project it and it yeah, fake it till you make it. That's right. right. Hey, yeah, why not? Exactly. What? Uh, all right. So you got your your home routine, which is in New Mexico, like mm -hmm. when you're at at your shop. Yep. Uh, and then you have your on the road. So for you, I'm going to say because you kind of split time, I'd say almost half and half. Or, yeah. Or pretty as close. close as I can manage it. Uh, what is your AM routine, both at home and on the road? Do you have one? Mm, sorta. I uh, I like to lay in bed. I enjoy it. It's one of my favorite things in the world. Whether I'm asleep or not, I love laying in a fucking bed. And so most That's mornings, are, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you must get a lot done. I'm super productive. <laughs> if uh, if procrastination were paid, yeah. I'd be one of the richest people you've ever met. But right. it's not. And so without because of the last minute, I do get a lot of shit done. Yeah. yeah. Uh, without the last minute, I wouldn't get a whole lot done. Yeah. And I do it all the time. It's uh there's a part of me that sees it as a hang up, but it's never really hemmed me up to a degree that causes me long-term grief. Yeah. So I, I like, I got two and a half weeks to get these three things done. If I wait until, if I start seven days before I leave, I should be done two days before I leave. So I'll start five days before I leave. And then I'm still working the day I'm trying to leave. <laughs> That's, I mean, that's pretty much the standard. Yeah. So morning routine then? Morning routine. Oh, is that what, <laughs> we, is that what we're talking about? Uh, most mornings I roll out early with the dogs, uh, on the road particularly. Uh, my brother feeds at the house. Well, what's early? Uh, he leaves, I don't know, 5.30, 5.45. So that's so. when you get up. Well, I, the dogs get up, and then at the house he feeds, and then they all get in the truck with me. So I have four, five, six dogs in the truck with me when he goes to work. And then I lay, in the, I lay in the truck with the dogs until, oh, eight or nine. And then I get up and, you know, stretch my toes a little bit and scratch my ass and wander in the house and make coffee and breakfast. And then I wander out to the shop at some point after that. And so that's, uh, that's at home. And then on the road, 
there's no shop to wander in. No, no, I so. just I, I get up and feed, and then we take a nap after breakfast. You know, post <laughs> post breakfast nap. You know, because you don't want to you don't want to do shit on a full stomach. You know, you can twist a dog's stomach by yeah. exercising too hard. Yeah, you should um, wait at least twelve at, hours at before least, you do anything. At least. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, usually I don't know between five and six. Yeah, we get up and. She gets her chicken, and we wander around for a minute and pee in the weeds and then get back in the truck. And I usually, most mornings, I'm up between 8 and 9. Yeah. What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. What, I mean, when you're on the road, like I know it, it varies drastically where you're at. I mean, sometimes yeah. you're doing projects for people. Sometimes you're just fucking off and right. hiking. Sometimes, you know, you're going somewhere or whatever, but is there like even a checklist of like every morning, you know, I'm at least going to do this. I'm going to consume this. I'm going to movement wise. I'm going to do no. it. Just no, you just, no, I, I fly by the seat of my pants. It's uh, it's interesting living, living on the road with a dog as long as I have. Which has been how long? Uh, so I've been living out of my truck since 2008. So what is that, that 15 I feel like years that's an now? episode in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah. We're yeah. going gonna to dive into that. Yeah. So, you know, in a truck with a dog for 15 years, give or take a little bit. But uh, I've always thought that the way a dog lives is, uh, is admirable. And, and, and not just a dog, but most of nature outside of humans. Um, it's what's going on right this minute. Not 10 minutes ago, not 10 minutes from now. What are we doing right this minute? And so on the road, particularly, I tend to do that a lot. What am I going to do? Well, this is what I'm doing. I'm going to go for a walk. So I go for a walk. I don't really put a lot of planning into it unless it's something that I have to plan around. I play golf on the road quite a bit. And, you know, that requires at least a little bit of planning. But usually I play during the week. And during the week, most golf courses are dead. Yeah. So I can get away with a lot and a lot of latitude even there. And a lot of courses will let the dog come out with me. So it's nice. But yeah, I don't really, uh, unless I have an, a set goal for like climbing, I got back on the rocks this trip and uh, getting in my head because I'm by myself and I've got gear so that I can climb by myself roped so I don't fall and, you know, <laughs> grab a broken hold and fall to my death because I thought I was cool. Yeah. Um, getting all that gear set up, getting to the rock, knowing where I'm going to go. So there's some planning to that, but that's all based off of what I'm doing that day. It's still not, I don't plan way out yeah. at all. What, uh, in terms of the decision to live in your truck versus not, I mean, I've known you for 25 years, 25 fucking years. I, know, now, right? so. I was thinking about that yeah. coming in here. I'm like, fuck, it's been 25 years. Yeah. The, uh, and I want to get your version of the story on the day that we met or how we met. I'll, I'll, I'll give you. I'll let you share it. I'll, I'll give you the best I can because my memory is not as good for that yeah. shit as yours. But, um, but the, you know, I'm curious. The like the last time you lived in a house, like in in an actual residence and not out of your truck, was '07. Yeah, yeah. Before I went to Bahrain in, in Santee, right? That yep. little shithole place that mm -hmm. uh, had mouse shit everywhere. Yeah, the, the, the rental property that yeah. the skunk got. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was it like a conscious decision? Because I know even, I mean, back during SEAL Team 3 days, there there were periods where you either slept in the platoon hut or you slept in your fucking Land Cruiser out in the, in no, the that was lot, like, That was early on because I didn't have a place yet. So when I came back, when I came out of college, I was living in the Land Cruiser. Okay. And then the base base security rolled me up and I lived in the platoon hut for a bit. And then I got I, I went ahead and got an apartment. Yeah. Um, part of the impetus for getting in my truck now was... As I was getting ready to get out of the military, it dawned on me that I'd seen more foreign countries than U.S. states. And I think probably the vast majority, particularly of American population, is guilty of this. Nobody sees the shit that they're around. They travel to see shit. Every state has really neat shit in it. Every state has most every environment in it. So there's a lot to see just in the country. And most people haven't seen it. And so I decided... I was going to do a year. That was the goal when I built my truck out. I was going to do a year of traveling the U.S. and seeing more of it. And the more I did it, the better I liked it. And uh, when my brother gave me the opportunity to build shops at his place so I didn't have the overhead because it was his place, so I built a shop at his place, and I 
shit, I wasn't doing knives. And then I wasn't, I wasn't doing anything. I just wanted a place to have to store all my shit. And, uh, after I did that and traveled most of that year, it dawned on me, I really like doing this. So I'm going to see if I can't set it up so that I can just travel at least half of every year. And then I've got a place to call home for all intents and purposes. So I've got a place to store all my extra shit and, and spring out of, but I, any time I can just pick up my, I can jump in my truck and just drive away. Yeah. And I, there's something, there's some, when I was a kid, my mom thought I was a gypsy. When I, when I was leaving to go in the military, she's like, yeah, I always knew you're, you, you weren't going to stay. My brother's been in the same state his whole life. He's never lived anywhere else. Even the same part of the state, really. Yeah, pretty I mean, close to, within yeah. Within 50 miles of where he, uh, 100 tops. Like where he's at right now is like, it's right at 60 miles from where we spent the majority of our childhood. Yeah, and he's never really gone anywhere mm-hmm. else. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, when, when I graduated high school, so when I started high school, we did one year together. His senior, my freshman, were the same year. He was working at a gas station between where we lived and the school. When I graduated high school, he was still working at a gas station. Yeah. And there's a part of like, there's no fucking way I could do that. Yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't leave fast enough. Well, so. And the military was the. Yeah. So I guess we'll, uh, we'll dig back into the, uh, to the, the truck life, if you will. I would like to go over some of your childhood and military career because it's, okay. yeah. it's significant. Yeah, again, it's your show. You do whatever you want, man. Oh, can I? Yeah. yeah thanks please, for that. Please, please carry on. Yeah. As uh, you were. Yeah, man, that's, that's really nice of you. I'm, I'm a giver yeah. that way. I heard that about you. Uh, you're also a taker though. Well, you, you know, like if, to balance it, it out. if, if the sender is correct, <laughs> then, you know, so you're originally from uh bum fuck New Mexico. I mean, really Albuquerque. Rio yeah. Rancho. Yeah. South, uh, no South Valley of Albuquerque actually. Okay. Yeah. It wasn't uh, until that. Well, we'll get into that. Yeah. So you, you grew up, uh, in the desert really. I mean, uh, on the Rio Grande river Valley. So mountains on the East and Mesa high desert yeah. on the West. How would you, uh, kind of synopsize your childhood? awesome it was <laughs> awesome <laughs> what made it awesome uh me oh okay. because uh, i was a part of it it was yeah. spectacular so humble uh, um now my uh my childhood i don't know that it was any different than anybody else's and actually you and i have talked about this so very similar i grew up i was i was the minority where i grew up um uh, mexicans and indians were and shit there was my graduating class was 400 give or take it's not a huge school, but not a tiny school. And there was, I think, 26 white kids in that class. Yeah. So, you know, that's, I, I grew up in that world. And the South Valley of New Mexico now is, shit, Albuquerque is one of the highest crime cities. I think it's the highest car theft in the nation. I mm-hmm. think it ranks one almost every year. Yeah. And uh, if you drive through Albuquerque with a U-Haul, you were going to get robbed if you stopped for more than 10 minutes. So it's just, bad, huh? yeah, it's, it's, it's stagger, really? staggering. Really? Is, and, uh, I mean, is there a, a market behind it or is it just? It, the, well, it's the, uh, there's a lot of the Mexican influenced drug cartel shit goes on in the South Valley, basically where I grew up. Mm-hmm. And there's a, there's a big influence of that. And apparently there's a market for it or they wouldn't keep doing it. Yeah. Uh, childhood wise though, I mean, you grew up uh, in kind of a more rural environment, yeah. right? Yeah. We were, um, we, it was, uh, I think it was 20 acres of alfalfa field that a guy owned and he just, partitioned it off and sold it off in half acre lots. So there was, I don't know, 10 or 12, 15 families down there. And they're all like trailers or what? Yeah. Yeah. yeah mobile homes. And it's not trailers. You don't say that with that, that, that condescension. It Just, was, it was yeah. mobile homes. Okay. Yeah. Fucking trailer park. <laughs> trailer. Is that what you grew up in? It wasn't a park. It was, uh, it was trailers <laughs> on lots. So it was worse than a park. <laughs> it was better. So Way a better. trailer park would have yes, been better than where yes, you were at. I am poor white trailer <laughs> trash. There, you, you happy there? I fucking said it out loud. I feel like I won. You, d- you did. You, you're a winner. <laughs> yep. You're a fucking winner. Nice work. Uh, Make yeah. me feel guilty about myself. Uh, I but, know uh, that, that, that's impossible, yeah. first of all. <laughs> but no, it was it was a good childhood. My mom was spectacular. Um, my stepdad was a piece of shit, but uh, mom was spectacular and just had her shit together. And your your real dad? Uh, he he suicided. Well, there's some dissension in the family that he didn't, but he suicided when I was two and a half. Yeah, and I have zero memory of him. I don't have a fucking clue. Yeah, apparently he was a hell of a musician. Um, but I don't, I don't know anything about him. 
yeah. other than what you know what I got from his side of the family. Do you know why? Uh, I mean, obviously, you, you don't know personally, but like, did your mom share any? So the the story is, and and a lot of his side of the family blamed it on my mom. He was musician, and he was good, and uh, he was into drugs and alcohol real heavy. And when she got pregnant with my brother, she told him flat out, "Clean your shit up, or I'll walk." And he did for a while, and then he got back into it, and so she walked. Yeah. And she was, you know, this is what I said, this is what I'm going to do. And, uh, and because of that, he suicided. That was the, that's the, what everybody believes. Now, whether that's the truth or not, I don't know. I mean, did you ever have any heart-to-hearts with your mom as you got older? Oh, yeah, and that's, that was her opinion as well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, was it an overdose? or? No, no, he shot himself twice in the head with a twenty two. Twice? Yeah. Well, that, that so lends itself to be a little strange. It's, it, it, it's interesting. So uh, we live next door. So when I was a teenager, we lived next door to a guy. His dad was the DA for the case of my paternal father's suicide. Yeah. And uh, apparently, and I don't, there's some science that backs this. I've read into it a little bit. If, if somebody's going to shoot themselves in the head, they'll do this, but they can see the gun and they'll flinch. And he had the wherewithal to realize that he damaged his frontal lobe and put another one behind his ear. Mm. Now, again, there, that's where the my brother and I even disagree on this, whether it was whether a suicide foul play or, or foul super play. committed. Right, yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah, commitment versus, yeah, somebody wants yeah. you. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, I don't, it's, it's funny the number of people, you know, I tell this story to them, they're like, oh my God, that's so, I fucking didn't have anything to do with me. I was two yeah. and a half. Yeah. I don't even care. Yeah. But it's, it's interesting. But aside from that, I don't give a shit. And so this, I mean, you had more than one stepdad growing up, right? I mean, kind uh, of. Yeah. Yeah. One is so interestingly, uh, the, the, the grandpa dad story. So the, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, he set it up. You know, I'm going to knock it out of the park. I can't leave that alone. Um, so the stepdad I had from two and a half, three years old until 15 knew my paternal father's family and was actually married to my grandmother on that side yeah. before I was born. So he knew my mom. And then after my dad suicided, if that is what happened, he swooped in and helped out. And, you know, she was 25 with two kids. And he was how old? seemed to me he was somewhere around 12 years older than her 12 15 years older mm-hmm. i honestly don't know it was somewhere in that range and i can't even ask anymore my brother doesn't remember either but i think it was somewhere around 12 or 15 years older than her yeah so in his 30s yeah and um uh, he did all manner of different shit you know road crew uh construction uh over the road trucker for a long for a, for a number of years did you ever ask your mom like hey i know you were young and two kids and whatever mm-hmm. but yeah, That's no, pretty fucking twisted. You no, know, we had to, we had that conversation. She's like, it, because of the times and where I was in life, and I, she, she said flat out, you know, I was twenty five with two kids, and I truly thought I needed somebody to help me out. Yeah. And by the time she realized she didn't, she was already in, and she was trying to do the right things for the right reasons, family and all that. You know, he was an abusive fuck. He was an abusive fuck. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What? To me and my brother. Like physically, emotionally. Oh yeah, verbally, physically. Everything. He was he was mentally emo- He was mentally abusive to my little sister. And she was actually his daughter, strangely enough. Um, so half sister, but uh, he was physically abusive to me and my brother, like horrendously so. Yeah, I was beat with everything from uh, from a belt to uh, an extension cord, two by four shovel handle. He didn't give a shit if he had it in his hand; he'd he'd beat me with it. Yeah. And I don't mean like, hey, stop that. I mean like a full on fucking full tilt, hold me and beat me. Yeah, and but, your brother. Uh, my brother's son, my brother, older brother, he felt the need to try and protect me. So he'd take a lot of beatings for me, which I always thought was weird because he'd stand and take it. And I made that fucker work to beat me. Like yeah. he had to, if he didn't catch me right away, he wasn't beating me because I beat, I, I, I <laughs> see you fucker. And it kind of reminds it, me of like uh, the radio flyer. Yeah. It uh, irritated movie. the shit out of him. You know, don't fucking run from me. You think I'm just going to stand here and let you beat me? What do you yeah. think? Yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, he was he was just a prick, and and I don't know. It's like a it was like a psychological issue with him. He wanted he he needed that reinforcement for some yeah. reason because he did it to my sister. I mean, did your mom ever uh, stand up and be like, "Hey, fuck face"? What? She did on a number of occasions, and th- there were several occasions where it came 
real close to, well, somebody's going to die in here tonight. But for whatever reason, it never came to that, probably positively, but. Yeah. I mean, did she uh, ever get involved where she'd try to get in the middle and he'd get physical with her? No, I never saw him get physical with her, which is probably fortunate, particularly as me and my brother got older, because I was a mama's boy to my core, and my brother was too, to some degree, but, you know, because abusive fucking dad, but uh, no, they, as we got older, we're like, I think we could take him. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's high-low him. Well, and, and it, it got that, bad. The, the one that comes to mind when you, when you ask that, I was, I don't remember what the fuck he was beating me for that night, but I was in bed. We had bunk beds in the trailer. Are you happy? It's on wheels. <laughs> yes. It wasn't. It, the wheels were off and it was on blocks. Okay. So, yeah. So, so yeah. that's legit then. <laughs> yeah. No, it's totally not a trailer then. No, I know. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and it was cool. a double wide. I mean, it was tight. Yeah. It was high end shit. Yeah. No, I can tell. Uh, so bunk beds and I was on the bottom bunk. My brother had the top bunk and he came in and he pinned me under my blankets so he could beat me so I couldn't run. And my brother rolled out of bed. He'd made a, he was in high school at the time. So he was maybe a sophomore in high school. So I was probably, I don't know, sixth grade. And I was, I was, I was a little kid anyway, but I was, I was lippy. We, you and I've met, you, you know this about me. I was, yeah, uh, I, I don't see that side. I don't remember what it was about, but he was, he was beating me. And my brother got out of bed and got a bat that he had made in wood shop. And my mom was coming down the hall with a cast iron skillet. Jesus. And so it got, that was probably, and that was when she actually told him, you need to fucking find another place. You need to get the fuck out of here. And so that was kind of the beginning of the end of that whole thing. And then my brother and I both had our individual episodes with him where we were both like, okay, I'm ready to give you a shot, old man. Let's fucking do this. Yeah. And did it come to that? And it never did because he, like most chicken shit abusive fucks, he saw, oh, fuck, I might have to earn this. And like all criminals, he was a fucking chicken shit. Yeah. And so with my brother, it was over a set of uh, jumper cables. <laughs> fucking it's random shit. And he, he was taking jumper cables that he said were his, and they belonged to my brother. My brother was like, those are mine. If you fucking touch them again, I'm going to fucking put you down. <laughs> <laughs> fucking jumper cables. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, I mean, he'd been such a dick for so long. Yeah. Like, it, it got to the point where pretty much any excuse was going to be enough. Yeah. Uh, for me, it was uh, my sister's, so I was 17, so it was her 12th birthday. He was living in a truck, and he was driving, and he was at a truck stop, and he wanted to see her on her birthday. And she was a little girl, and she thought that, you know, it's my daddy and all that shit, and so I drove her to see him. And uh, he was playing head games with her about, you know, this will probably be the last time you're going to see me because I've got a heart condition and I'm going to die. And he just fucking, Amy, he fucking crushed her emotionally, 12-year-old girl on her birthday. And I sent her to go get in the car. And when I sent her to the car, I told him, I said, if I ever see you in, on, or around her again, I will fucking put a permanent end to this shit. It just infuriated me that, you know, somebody, God, he had to have been in his 50s at that point could behave that way towards a child is just yeah. it, it, unconscionable. Yeah. And I, and I was, I was fully prepared to cave his head in and fucking leave him in his, in his truck. Yeah. Now is the time to get your financial house in order. If you wait to pay down credit card balances, you may regret it. Your debt's getting more expensive. The minimum monthly payments are going to get harder and harder to make. Homeowners, you have an opportunity to turn this around by using your home's equity to pay off that debt. American Financing's salary-based mortgage consultants will help you consolidate that debt into one payment. They're saving homeowners an average of $700 a month. What are you waiting for? You have time right now to call American Financing. It just takes 10 minutes. Costs absolutely nothing to get started. They'll review all your debt and show you how much you can save every month. Your monthly expenses are not going to decrease, and the government isn't going to help you. You have to help you. Make the call today. You owe it to yourself. American Financing. Call today, 866-890-9313. That's 866-890-9313. Or visit AmericanFinancing.net. I want to take a second to talk about something near and dear to my heart, and that is a staunch supporter of this podcast, which is Bub's Naturals. Uh, the hat sitting in front of me uh, here on our coffee table here in the studio belonged to Glenn Doherty. 
His nickname was Bub. Uh, I did two platoons with him. And his childhood best friend uh, and another colleague of theirs, uh, Sean is the best friend, TJ is their colleague, uh, started Bub's Naturals, which is a collagen and MCT oil company uh, in Bub's or Glenn's honor. And, um, you know, for me, it's, it's uh, an absolute honor to be sponsored by and working with a company that, um, you know, was started in the honor of one of my closest friends and, and a guy that I went to war with. And, uh, you know, the, the Bub's brand is not only super quality, um, you know, collagen, uh, collagen powder as well as MCT oil powder, um, you know, but they also give back to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation. Uh, they donate proceeds from their product sales to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation, which, uh, you know, to me just furthers, uh, you know, the, the mission set on Veterans Day. They give 100% back. So, uh, I do believe it's the best collagen on the planet. Uh, I like to mix it in with uh, morning coffee. The MCT oil powder, the same thing. Uh, mixes in very easy. It tastes great. Uh, and it just kind of adds everything that you want to start your day off from a brain health standpoint, from a joint support, gut support. Um, you know, MCT oil and collagen are, are two components, especially as as we age, uh, that are integral components to, uh, to health. And so uh, to be able to work with Bub's Naturals and... Uh, be able to to work with them and, and sponsor a product that uh, number one is a high quality product and number two is is so near and dear to uh, you know to my heart and to the Mike Drop podcast for for who it uh, was started for and what it stands for um, you know it's just a, it's an amazing amazing place to be so um, it is Whole Thirty approved um, it's uh, sport certified so you're not uh, going to run into any problems with that. Um, and I will say that, um, you know, right now they're, they're offering, uh, 20%, <clears throat> 20% off if you go to bubsnaturals.com and, uh, use the mic drop code. So, uh, I really highly encourage you to, to try it out, incorporate it into your day, day to day for joint health, for brain health, uh, for cognition, for gut health, and, uh, and to support an amazing organization that does a lot of things, uh, in Glenn Bub's honor. So, uh, go to bubsnaturals.com. Mic drop is the code, twenty percent off. Yeah. Uh, so there's that. That that was your kind of big moment of confrontation. To yeah, those yeah. Last time yeah, I was seventeen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So your brother got in a fight. Very similar and about the same age, somewhere around seventeen, eighteen. So for us, it was about a three year split between. Yeah, or, no, that was the jumper cable thing. Yeah. Look, all I'm saying is, is if you were to make a list of shit that you would get in a fight over in a trailer park, mm-hmm. jumper cables would be on that list. You fucking ain't right. <laughs> so, they would. There's I mean, no doubt. I mean, anybody that's been I mean, around a trailer shoot, park should understand that. <laughs> knows the value of a set of fucking <laughs> jumper cables. Uh, <laughs> God damn it. Um, all right. So sports. Yeah. What about them? Uh, what, <laughs> yeah. Fuck, fuck sports. <laughs> sports ball. You, uh, you did swim growing up. Any other sports? Oh, did I did you try to play any other sports. I uh, so I went out for uh, because I know how athletically fucking talented you I am. Are. I am staggeringly non-athletic, um, shockingly so. Actually, yeah. it turns out. Uh, I went out for high school football, but um, for where we were, and I don't know if this could be the same everywhere, but to go into freshman football, you had to train with the football team for spring training coming out of junior high school. So for, it was like a four month training thing to go and work out with the high school football team and, and screen to get into freshman football. And they had an old, um, it's a leg press, hip sled, whatever you want to call it. It had a metal plate with a chain adjustment for depth, a couple of springs, you know, so it would bounce instead of being just steel on steel. It was a senior that actually lived in my neighborhood I think he ended up being a Marine at some point. I think he, I think he went into the Marines. At any rate, um, he had a couple of hundred pounds on the hip sled and wanted me to adjust the chain so that it would come deeper. And it was just a, it was a three H chain about this long that went through a notch in a steel plate. And I was fucking with it and it got jammed. He's like, are you doing it? I was like, no, no, wait. And he just let the weight drop and it drug my index finger through the slot and it tore from, I don't know, from the knuckle all the way up underneath the seven stitches and, a fucked up finger, but I couldn't finish spring training. So I couldn't play freshman football. Hmm. And so when I started my freshman year, I wanted to do something. And, um, 
the swim team tryouts came out, and I always liked being in the water, and so I went out for swimming. And you made the team. So, I, yeah, I swam yeah. all four years. Yeah. Um, did you, you went to state and all that shit? Or? I went to state uh, my junior and senior year. I wasn't competitive, but I went. Yeah. I was competitive enough to get a slot, but not enough to be competitive. Like to place or anything? Yeah. No, no nowhere near. And during that time. Um, butterfly yeah. was my. Um during that time, I mean, there was, a, I remember there was an influence in terms of your decision making process to join the military and specifically go into the SEAL teams. Walk us through that. Uh, that. Um, mine was different than most, even at that era. Um, I mean, you were far enough behind me, there was more public knowledge of it then. I knew nothing. Um, I bow hunted with a guy in the neighborhood. He was, I think he was a year or two older than my mom. I bought a compound bow, taking it down to the riverbed to shoot, to teach myself how to shoot a bow. And he saw me one day and he offered to teach me. And he was actually an archer. He, he knew what he was about. This wasn't a, I'm going to tell him I can teach him how to, and then we're just no, going to no, wrestle he, no, in the he basement. Didn't, no, he didn't touch me where I pee or anything. No, he was, he was actually, he was a better father figure than my, than my stepfather ever was. Yeah. He, he was just a, he was a really good guy. He was, you know, he was old school, just a, a solid human being. Yeah. And um, he saw me with my a compound bow. He's like, Hey, you want to, you want to learn how to shoot a real bow and get rid of those training wheels. And you know, just kind of talked me up and started teaching me. And he best, I know he was a helicopter pilot during the Vietnam era and he'd flown missions either with or around seals. So I met him when I was 13, 14. So by my sophomore, junior year, I was starting to look at, okay, how the fuck do I get out of here? Cause I'm not staying. Yeah. And I mentioned that I might think about going in the military. And he said to me, he says, uh, I think that would be really good for you. But he said, uh, if, do you have an idea? I was like, I don't know, for an Army, Marines. He's like, I think given your desire to travel, you should go in the Navy. And then he played fucking, you know, he, he played with my brain. He's like, there's, there's a group of guys in the Navy. So they're, they're called the SEALs, and you should never even consider that. <laughs> so That's way uh, too hard yeah, for you. Yeah, he did the reverse psychology shit on a kid, basically. Yeah. And he said, they're, they're, they do, most people don't even know what they do, but he said, I flew with and around those guys, and they're fucking batshit crazy. But he said, I think the Navy, yeah, it was kind of an aside. Like, he just kind of pitched it in. And then, but I think the Navy would be really good for you and you should go join the Navy and, yeah. you know, yada, yada, yada. And so my best friend from high school, who we actually did an appointment with. Yeah. Tommy Baca. Tommy Baca. Uh, the other white guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually. Yeah. One of the other <laughs> white guys. Uh, Tom had been pestered by, so going into our, so we were juniors. It was like late spring of our junior year. And he had been pitched by every fucking branch of the service and i'd been pitched by the air force there's an air force base in albuquerque oh, I'd the been coast pitched. Guard. just just the coast guard and the air force that that's who wanted you right <laughs> everybody wanted tom coast guard and air force yeah. was up your alley air force air force <laughs> army and marines had called me yeah and i just wanted to talk to a navy recruiter because a guy i trusted older you know father figure said i should go in the navy and i wanted to talk to a navy recruiter never got a call from a navy recruiter I was at Tom's house one afternoon and the Navy recruiter called him. He's like, dude, I keep telling you, I'm not doing this shit. He's like, here, talk to my friend. And he just hands me the phone. I'm like, who the fuck is that? It was a Navy recruiter. And that's how I got into a Navy recruiter. So how the fuck did Tom end up? So, yeah, the, the, oh, well, that's, I'm getting there. Would you just give me Will a you minute? fucking tell your Jesus, story? how long, are we on a timeline? I mean, how long can you drag this out for? How long do you want me to? I mean, not, not long. Okay. Uh, so... I talked to Navy recruiter. I went in, I was uh, wiring houses. Uh, so I was working as a journeyman electrician as I, as a high school student. And so I took my ass fab and everything was good. And I went in for EM electrician's mate. And I asked my detailer and to his, or my recruiter to his credit, he didn't try to blow smoke up my ass. And I heard horror stories from guys, most of my career about how their recruiters told them all kinds of lies and shit. But my recruiter was dead honest. He's like, look, I don't know a damn thing about the teams. I know it exists. <clears throat> and he said, I know that in boot camp sometime, I think he said in the first two weeks during your, your in-doc and boot camp, they're going to show you a film 
when they show you the film, they'll ask for volunteers. He said, your ASVAB scores qualify you for any program in the Navy. You know, verbal and math, the two big ones that they look at. He said, so if that's something you're interested in, when they show that video, stick your paw in the air and volunteer. Even the nuke program, you qualified for that? Yeah, oh, shit. Yeah. Did you get like a 99 or what? I don't know. I couldn't fucking tell you. I think the combined was, I think my combined was 89 or 90, 91. Yeah. It, it was high enough to qualify me for anything I wanted to do, which fucking weird because I was a great student. <laughs> I mean, I was at, I was, I was better than my brother by a, by a yeah. bit, but so that's how I ended up going into the teams. And so I left, Tom and I were still, you know, fucking best friends from high school. And I went to the East coast and I did my first deployment. I came home from my first deployment. So this would have been around 92 yeah, late 91, early 92. Well, it was Christmas. It was Christmas 91. So the, 92. the whole time from when you joined until, I mean, you, you went through boot camp, A school, Buds, fucking Fort Benning, Airborne, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Went to SEAL Team 8 before you ever talked to Tom again? No, no. I saw him every time I came to town. So every time I come to town, I'd either locate him or I knew his mom. And so I'd find his mom, find out where he was living. And so we, we'd hang out. So after my first deployment, so now I'm more like four years out of high school. And he's... We're, we're bullshitting about stuff and it was more of an awkward getting together than yeah. like that we didn't have anything to talk about he was going to a local community college fucking tractionless for all intents and purposes yeah and uh we said our goodbyes and i went back to the east coast and i came back from my next deployment and i reached out and i couldn't locate him couldn't get it. I couldn't, his mom had moved. He had moved. I didn't have phone numbers. Then, you know, there weren't cell phones. You had a fucking phone. It was attached to your house and that's yeah. how you talk to people. Yeah. So I couldn't locate him. And uh, when I came back from my third deployment, I was, I don't know, two weeks in my new apartment. And I get a phone call like a Sunday afternoon. Who the fuck is this? Tom. Dude, what the fuck? I've been to town two or three times since the last time I saw you, I haven't been able to find you. He's like, oh yeah, well, you know, I, I joined the Navy and went to Bud's and I'm on my way to SEAL Team 3. I'm like, oh, fuck you. <laughs> no I, I, did, I did, I thought, I thought surely, I'm like, there is no fucking way because he was so, at the time, like there was nothing, I mean, I wasn't militant by any stretch of the imagination, but I was in the military and, yeah. and I was doing shit and there was something about our last man. That's what he told me on the phone. He's like, yeah, after we talked the last time, he said it, it irritated the shit out of me that we were that good of friends. We had nothing to talk about anymore. Oh shit. And he said, so I decided at that, when we, when, when I saw you in Christmas of 91, I decided that I was going to, it was either Christmas 91, Christmas 92. Cause he was 188. I think he graduated in 90. Yeah. Somewhere around there. I like, guess. Yeah, so I decided I was going to go in the Navy and I was going to be a SEAL. And he said, and he told me this <laughs> motherfucker on the phone. He says, uh, I figured if you could do it, there's no fucking way I couldn't do it. <laughs> Fucking dickhead. Dude, that's fucking if, you, if you can make it, there's no yeah. fucking way I'll have a problem with it, you piece <laughs> of fucking motherfucker. I was like, well, why didn't you tell me you were going? He's like, you think I'm fucking stupid? <laughs> like, you're in and you could call people. I'm like, I didn't know any Buds instructors. He said, I bet you would have fucking found some if you'd yeah. have known I was a Buds. I'm like, well, you know, maybe. <laughs> so yeah, just completely fucking joined and did his own thing. And that's then, you know, fast forward another, what, almost 10 years. And then we're in a platoon together. Yeah. And he's my LPO. Yeah, that's fucking weird. <laughs> What are the odds? I know. They're fucking deep. I mean, it's, it's two kids from New Mexico that yeah. grew up together, both end up in the teams, and then, in you know, the, together, the yeah. one that's been in longer ends up junior to the one that's been in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. God, that's wild. Yeah, it's a fucking crazy. Yeah, I mean, I, I knew that back then, but, it, like, it didn't dawn on me until yeah. sitting here right now that, like, Jesus Christ, that's, yeah. that's fucking crazy. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And it, it just completely because he was frustrated that we didn't have shit to talk about anymore. Yeah. Wow. Or that was, you know, that's the way he, he told it. He's like, yeah, I was just pissed that we didn't have shit to talk about anymore. It was bullshit. Yeah. God, that'd be fucking wild. <laughs> so, uh, your East coast time, uh, mm -hmm. you went through buds in, uh, 90. Uh, so I graduated January 90. I started, uh, I, I didn't class up with my original class. I was slated for 163, and, uh, I, I wasn't a runner. So, oh shit. You say wasn't like you are now. Well, I, I became. I was, <laughs> I was pretty fucking solid when I broke my wings. Um, I, uh, I'd never really run. Yeah. Uh, for, for physical fitness testing, 
which I guess a lot of states don't even do anymore, but in New Mexico at the time, it was a 600-yard dash. Yeah. And that was the fucking standard for running. And prior to going to the Navy, I never run farther. I don't know if I'd ever run a full mile. Uh, when I took the BUDS test in boot camp, fourth week, week of boot camp, that mile and a half like to fucking killed me. Is it the 600-yard dash? That's what they called it. I feel like 600 yards isn't really a dash. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's fucking... I mean, look at most of America now. That would kill yeah. fucking three quarters. Oh, no. I mean, country. fucking 10 yards is a dash for most Americans. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, that was, the, that was the running standard. But I, you know, I was good in the water. I was comfortable in the water. And I think, I think comfortable is better than strong. Yeah. By, by, well, you know as well as yeah. I do. Um, but I was comfortable in the water, so the water was not a big deal. The, uh, the BUDS entrance exam was different then. It wasn't as athletically geared yeah. as it is now. Yeah. But uh, the, the swim was no big deal. Pull-ups, push-ups, sit-ups, I was adequate. My pull-ups were really good for, at the time, I don't know, I think I did, I want to say I did 17 or 18 pull-ups for the, for the entrance exam up at Great Lakes, and it was one of the better pull-up scores they'd had. Yeah. But I'd never run before. And it was, a, it was an EOD guy giving the test, a big fucking oak of a human. And we're walking out. He's like, you're doing really good. You, you're going to be all right. I was like, I've never run a mile and a half before in my entire fucking life. <laughs> He's like, what? Are you? And he, he, he stopped. And he looked at me. Are you shitting me? I was like, no. No, I, I've never run that far ever. I don't have any ID. He's like, well, I'll just, it's on a track. I'll coach you every, every lap. And so every lap, you're a piece of shit. You're going to fail. <laughs> you're a piece of shit. You're going to fail. And that, so that was his coaching technique, which was solid. But My how times have changed. I, <laughs> but I finished it. Yeah, you know, I finished, uh, I don't know. I, I think the time limit was 12 minutes. And I was like, I don't know, mid tens. Yeah. Uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't speedy by any stretch, but I finished it. Yeah. And then I didn't run at all until I took it again in A school. And then I didn't run at all until I got to buds. And so I ran myself into uh, shin splints and stress fractures. Yeah. It, just being a bud student, yeah. uh, just being in pre-phase, waiting to class up. When I did my uh, class up physical for 163, you know, they raked that backside of the uh, little uh, reflex hammer up your shins. And I was like, ah, shit. It's like, yeah, you're gonna, I'm going to hold you and put you on a running program. Yeah. So, yeah. But that was the first time I'd ever seen the ocean. Yeah. I checked into Bud's five days before my 19th birthday. It was the first time I'd ever seen the ocean. Wow. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah, landlocked New Mexico. Yeah. Um, graduate Bud's, go to Benning, uh, go to SEAL Team 8. You did three deployments there, right? Yeah, two I mean, and well, and see, and there's the, there's the two or three. Um, my first platoon was put together for the first Desert Storm. And it was, uh, I think there was nine or ten new guys in that platoon because all the other platoons were already formed up. And so they put us together specifically for the eventuality that we were going to be part of that. And then we didn't, we ended up not being a part of that. So we did kind of a pseudo deployment. We were together for shit. I think we were together for two and a half years as a platoon. And we did a bunch of uh, like trying to think of the right to, uh, acronym for it, you know, the military acronym. We did all the, all the training exercises that platoons on deployment typically did. We would fly forward and do those. So the platoons could do whatever they were doing. Yeah. And so we were, shit, we were, we did a solid six months of that. We didn't, it wasn't like a legit deployment. We'd fly out and do shit for three weeks a month. And then we'd fly back to the States yeah. and then we'd fly out and do it here. And we did it in Turkey and we did it in North Africa and we did it in Asia or in Europe because that was our theater of deployment. And so then we actually did a full ARG, Amphibious Readiness Group, deployment. And that, at that time, SEAL Team 8 was the strike platoon team. Yeah, yeah, we went into the, that, that was... Can you kind of talk to, to the listener of what that means? <laughs> Do you even know? I, mean, I, I kind of know. Yeah. I mean, I guess your, your understanding so at they, the time. So they took us from the ARG, the Amphibious Readiness Group, where we were deploying on the Marine... On the Marine side of the Navy vessels and they, they started attaching us to the carrier battle group so that we had the air support and mobility that came with that. Yeah. And that was kind of the, the start of that for us. And then we were European theater, European North African theater. Yeah. Um, and then again, then the teams were on East coast and West coast were broken down by desert jungle and cold weather. And there were three teams on each coast and you know each team had an area of operation and so we were technically desert and so north africa and, and europe desert yeah and uh you didn't do cold weather too no 
Really? Now that was uh, it's team two. It was two, and then four was Jungle. Yeah. Yeah. So Jungle. So four was doing the Panama and the and the South America deployments, and two was doing the Alaska trip, which is why I still have never been to Alaska, yeah. you know, the last state that I haven't touched. And uh, so, and and they were doing Banger, Maine. So they were doing all the cold weather shit, and we were doing desert stuff. I guess it's just surprising that if you're a carrier based strike platoon going to Europe, you'd think that you'd probably do some cold weather stuff. There's yeah. a fair bit of that in Europe. There, there was a tiny bit. Yeah. We were, <laughs> I was cold on more than one occasion as yeah. a, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't, yeah. the, the, the uh, needs of the Navy and yeah. a, a, apparently people with stars, they, they know more than everybody yeah. else. Not just to sure. ask them for sure. They do. Yeah. Yeah. They'll, they'll be, yeah. <laughs> and it's so far above everybody else. They can't even explain it. Right. Just yeah, yeah, just, it. I can't even use words. I can't, I don't have the crayons <laughs> or the patience to explain <laughs> this to you. The, uh, you did one of the, de the deployments, you end up getting diverted to Somalia or off the coast of Somalia. Right? Yeah, that was, uh, that was my third. And so we were, I guess not to interrupt, but before you jump into that, anything substantial happen on the second deployment or was it all training and, uh, it was all training. We almost got to do security for the Olympics in Spain. Mm -hmm. Um, but we didn't almost, yeah, yeah. there's a whole lot of that. I and almost joined the Navy. There's a whole lot of that shit in the military yeah. and we almost got to, but, uh, yeah, nothing. Uh, it, it was just you know, it was a standard European deployment, yep. you know, battle group deployment. We uh, it was the first time I'd ever been lost on an aircraft. Really? Yeah, yeah. We were flying, uh, flying lost on an aircraft. Yeah, the, in <laughs> in or on. We were on a fifty three, and we we're doing across the Med from Aviano in italy and we were going to turkey to do a one of those big cross training exercises with nato forces and it was rough weather shitty weather and the pilots got fucking turned around somehow and i don't I, to this day i don't know how the fuck it happened but i remember sitting in the back and watching a pilot with a fucking chart turning it <laughs> i'm like well, that's that a good sign that can't be good <laughs> And so they did an emergency landing on the carrier battle group that was in the med. And, and when we hit the deck on, on the carrier, the Marine security force was locked and loaded all the way around the flight deck. Cause we weren't supposed to be out there. Jesus. Uh, yeah, Cause they were going to run out of fuel. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, Damn. but I mean, but aside from that as typical, you know, super cool. We got to do all this shit. I'd learned to climb in Europe because of, you know, having those first deployments. Yeah. And sport climbing being such a big deal in Europe, it was a really easy thing to do most everywhere we ported. Yeah. And so, yeah, nothing, nothing spectacular out of that. Yeah. I right, so I want to talk to you real quick about a product I've been using for a long time, long time sponsor and supporter of the show, Mudwater. Uh, got rid of coffee, switched to Mudwater. Uh, it tastes great. I like to mix my uh, Bubs collagen and, uh, and MCT oil powder with it. Uh, a little bit of vanilla drops, and uh, it's fantastic. Um, it's got a host of different ingredients. There's cacao and chai for a hint of caffeine and kind of a hot chocolate-type flavor. There's lion's mane for focus, cordyceps to promote natural energy, and uh, both chaga and raishi to support a healthy immune system. It's Whole30 approved, 100% USDA certified organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, vegan, and kosher. Uh, they do donate monthly to support psychedelic research, and they have since day one. Uh, go get your free frother and free samples of coconut creamer and sweet sweetener. If you go to mudwater, M U D W T R.com forward slash Mike, uh, on that link, you get all the samples, the frother for free. And that's mudwater, M U D W T R.com slash Mike for that free author, uh, free frother rather. So it's a great product. I've been using it for a long time. Uh, don't get the upset stomach or the jitters with the tons of caffeine and coffee. Uh, and it's a great vehicle to add uh, whatever other supplements you want to throw into your morning routine. That's mudwater.com slash Mike. In today's crazy world with natural disasters, travel, pandemics, supply chain shortages, you name it, Jace Medical comes through with antibiotics uh, that you can just fill out a simple form and get online. They've recently added ivermectin to their list of uh, appropriate and available medications. Uh, and I will say, you know, I've, I've used this in a number of occasions, whether it's for uh, myself, family, uh, you can even use them on your pets. Um, make sure that you get the dosages correct. But, uh, you know, being able to, to order medications, antibiotics, ivermectin, et cetera, 
uh, is pretty key and, and extremely important. Um, you, you never want to get caught unprepared. Uh, everybody should be empowered enough to care for themselves and their loved ones during the unexpected. And Jace handles everything from online evaluations to licensed pharmacy medication delivery and ongoing consultation and care. Um, I can't recommend these guys enough for all your antibiotic and uh, emergency supply needs as it relates to those types of medications. Go to jacemedical.com and enter code DROP at checkout for discount on your order. That's promo code DROP at J-A-S-E medical.com. And uh, so the third deployment. Yeah, so we were, we were in northern Italy, uh, Trieste, and we were, there was, it was like seven of us that were really big into climbing, and we discovered that northern corner of, uh, of Italy bordered Yugoslavia. There's a big valley up there called uh, Val Rosandra, the big granite quarries and shit up there. And so we discovered that we could take two buses out of Trieste into this little bitty town and hike across the border into Yugoslavia That's to climb. Smart. The climbing was better in Yugoslavia than it was on the Italy side. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we, we were hiking across the border to climb. And uh, I, uh, I took a rock in the head on one of those. We'd been going up there. We were there for, I think we were in port there for almost two weeks. And like half of the platoon were a bunch of skiers. And so they went up into the Swiss Alps and they were skiing. And then the Somalia thing happened and we got pulled back onto the boat to go down and, and give battle group support on the coast for the evacuation. So after the Black Hawk down, we were down there. I think we were in, I think we were on the coast maybe, maybe three or four days after the Black Hawk down episode. Yeah. Yeah. And during that time, I mean, there were times where you were having to get into the water and... and oh, they uh, wanted us to do, they wanted us to do a, a beach survey so the Marines could do a landing. That was the goal. And it was a bunch of... Uh, there was a bunch of shallow rock kind of coralish shit. But um, maybe a mile and a half, two miles down the coast from Mogadishu, there's a food processing plant, meat processing plant, where they just dump all of their shit in the ocean. So the sharks there are fucking bonkers. We were coming in on a destroyer, and you could see sharks bow surfing the wave, wow. the, the bow waves. Let's get in the water. And they're like, we want you guys I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you're adorable. No. <laughs> so we did, uh, they had, uh, it was like a, a light laser yeah. depth finder. So that we were, we were doing as good as we could beach soundings off of Zodiacs going into the beach. And we went over the beach and did photo ops and shit and had some, had some little skinnies roll up in a truck, not sure who we were, and we're like, oh, fuck, did we just cause an international incident? But nothing of merit actually came out of it other than we got some cool pictures and we were in the area. Yeah. The, the beach survey thing is, is wild to think about. You know, when you went through training, when I went through training, doing, you know, mark and move, mm -hmm. you know, fucking weighted. <laughs> the one we did in Hawaii. Yeah, fuck. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they're, yeah. everybody about fucking drowned. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, it's just crazy. Like with technology being what it is now, there's absolutely zero reason to do any of right. that. You know, I mean, none. Yeah, and that's, aside from maintaining a historical reference yeah. and relevancy, which is a fucking total waste of time. I mean, right. as cool as it is, and yeah, that I mean, like juice being worth the squeeze, it's not right. worth. I mean, we we you should spend that time being good at the things that are going to save your life, not. There's a part of me that thinks because of what we've done a lot, well, what we did for 20 years, you know, 9-11 to leave in Afghanistan, having that water roots and being able to call yourself a SEAL and being capable, because the knowledge isn't complicated, but the, the application of it, the application, the physical exertion to swim on a line in a surf zone with shitty currents and actually do the work. I think that's something that's laudable. I mean, yeah. whether it should be a focus, I, I would agree with you. I don't think it should be a focus, but I think everybody should have that capability if you want to be able to call yourself a SEAL. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I don't disagree the, with the, that. The, just, the water side of it being the yeah, point. Yeah. Yeah, I, no, that makes sense. Um, so you wrap that deployment up. Um, you go back to Team 8. Well, I, I fucking crashed and burned on that. I fucking, carrying a rucksack, I tripped in a fucking weird way in a, in a rock area at night and blew my meniscus on my left leg and broke my left arm. And so I flew home from that deployment, like maybe 
three or four weeks before we were done anyway. Yeah. And so I flew home for surgery and rehab and shit. And I was, I had been looking at going, my goal was to go to college and change all the shit that I didn't like about the teams because I didn't think it was being managed properly and they needed me at the top. <laughs> they need my guidance they and did. leadership. They truly did. <laughs> and uh, I mean, they still do probably, all things considered. Um, they may not know it. <laughs> and, and this comes from a place of zero personal invest investment i don't i don't think i don't it comes from no arrogance right. i just think i know shit that they don't get i actually don't disagree <laughs> in all seriousness i don't, I don't disagree no i know we've, we've been friends yeah. for a long time for yeah. a reason yeah um so i i was looking to go to college and i was trying to find an avenue to do that and uh i started putting together a ROTC package you know prior enlisted ROTC package and uh, my co at the time fucking spectacular guy he's like i heard you want to go to college yeah, i do like why don't you go to the academy i'm too old it's like whatever it's like i know people at the academy i'll get you in the academy i'm like i'm, I'm too old it was, uh, it was a it was a tuesday actually we had this conversation on a tuesday he's like i'm gonna drive up to annapolis tomorrow and i'll get you in he said you sure you, you sure you want to go i was like well, if, if you can get me in the academy i'll go to the academy but i'm too old he's like I'll go make some shit happen. So he drove up to the academy on Wednesday. That's saying something for a fucking COO he, he, teammate to, he to do that. He was just, he was a fucking super, yeah. like, our, my whole career, I can name the guys that I would worked with, particularly on the brass level at the officer level, that I would voluntarily work with again, I can list on a hand. Yeah. Same as you. Yeah. And he was one of them. He was just that good a guy. Yeah. He just had his shit together. And so he drove up to, to Annapolis. And he came back, and on Thursday, he called me into his office. He's like, you're too fucking old. You're ahead of me. I can't get in. I'm like, I fucking told you that. <laughs> How old were you? So I was 23. God, that's wild. So they won't let you start the academy if you're older than 21. Mm. That's, that's their structure, whatever. Fine. Yeah. So he says, all right, so here's what we're going to do. You're getting a fucking ROTC scholarship. I'm like, yeah, they give like, I think they were given 3000 a year nationwide and there was like i don't know sixty thousand applicants a year yeah I'm like the odds aren't good he's like i'm gonna make that shit happen he's like i couldn't get to the academy i can make this shit happen well he knew bill shepherd and so he got me a letter of recommendation from shepherd and like who the, he who the fuck is bill shepherd original astronaut seal oh, I'd fuck it, man. oh yeah yeah bill there's shepherd. my fucking yeah. history lesson <laughs> I didn't know either, but yeah. he did. And yeah. so he introduced me to him and he, he writes me a letter of recommendation and he got me, he got me a ROTC scholarship. Oh shit. Yeah. So that's how that happened. Yeah. So that's how I ended up going to college. Did you pick Arizona on purpose or was so it I picked, like uh, I picked three and I wanted to go, I, mama's boy, remember, don't, yeah. don't ever forget. I was a mama's boy. Um, I wanted to go somewhere close to New Mexico. I wanted to be closer to home and New Mexico, University of New Mexico didn't offer, they, they, they upended their Navy ROTC. They still had Army and Air Force, I think, but they didn't have Navy during the time that I was looking to go. So I applied at uh, Texas A&M, UC Boulder, and University of Arizona, Tucson. And Arizona was the first to answer. I got into all three. I got accepting letters to, to all three because at the time in my military background, my SAT scores, everything worked. I, I could have got it. I could, I could have went to all of them. But when I got my acceptance letter from U of A, I was like, fuck, I got into a college. Holy shit. So I just said yes. Yeah. I, I responded before I got the other acceptance letters. Looking back on it, would you, if you had gotten a yes from all three, would you still have picked Arizona? If I'd gotten them all at the same time, I think I would have ended up at Texas A&M. Yeah. That's weird to think. I know. Like, and, and they're a huge, like you wear a uniform yeah. every day. Yeah, that's a big deal. At there. Texas A&M. Yeah. At the U of A, it was once a week. Yeah. So it was, it was a completely different thing. So yeah, if I had gotten the acceptance letters in a different order, things would have been different. If I'd have got them all together, I probably would have chose Texas. Yeah, that's wild. So, I mean, we've talked about this, but I'd love to get your description of it. You know, going from being a 23, 24-year-old um or, you know, going to college as a 23, 24 year old seal that's been around the world a few times. Right. And, uh, what was that, that experience like going back to like going to college after? It was, uh, cause I never thought I was going to go to college. That was never my, that was never my trek. And that wasn't the sales pitch back then. 
Uh, it, you know, that wasn't the end all be all. If you don't go to college, you can't be shit. Fuck you. Yeah. Um, so it was never, it was never on my horizon and I didn't want to go to college for college sake. I wanted it so that I could get a commission and do grand things in the Navy yeah. and change policy and you know, all that shit. So yeah. have your own stateroom yeah, <laughs> on the ship. <laughs> we, uh, look how important I am. But at any rate, I, uh, I was, uh, and this is, this is my personal opinion of it. I was an average team guy from a, from a physical capability standpoint. And I worked hard to be average. And I, there were some things. I was a little bit better in the water than some guys. I could always do a shit ton of pull-ups. That was always a strength for me. But the general fitness of the teams is, as you know, it's next level. Yeah. And I always felt like I was fucking bringing up the rear and trying hard to maintain. <laughs> I did. I just, I just never felt like I was at the level of, cause I'd watch these fucking Glenn fucking good at a cocksucker, yeah. but a, a ton of guys, there was a guy at, uh, there was a guy at eight that was, I mean, he was, he had a halitosis. He was such a heavy al alcoholic. He got booted from damn neck for being an alcoholic. Yeah. And I watched that fucker on a Friday morning, three mile timed run, come out with a fresh cigarette, take a drag, set it on the curb. And they said go, and he left. And he was back at like 14.53. Jesus. He ran across the finish line, walked over, his cigarette burned down about that far. He walked over and, fuck, I hate running. <laughs> what the fuck? What the fuck? I, and I, yeah. you know, being around that your whole life, you're always, there's, there's a fucking level of performance expectation that yeah. should always be there, that drive. Yeah. And because I'd always felt like I was sucking a hind tit, then when I went to college, I was like, I'm a borderline superhero. The rest of the world, it's weird. Even other, you know, uh, so the, the unit at U of A was a combined Marine Corps Navy unit, uh, 160 kids probably. Not quite even split, probably 60, 40 Navy to Marines. Most shit, probably half of them prior active duty. And I was more fit than 90% of them. And I still wasn't a runner. And I was top 10% yeah. in that group of people. Yeah. And so it was a weird, it was a weird transition. What, what about like, I guess, culturally in classes and around campus and whatever? Was that a, a, a tough adjustment? Probably not as tough as it would be now, but yes. Um, going to, you know, liberal arts classes where they're talking about global stuff from places that I'd actually been that they hadn't that, that, you know, some 24 year old TA that's, you know, this is how things I'm like, I, I was there like fucking seven months ago and that's not how that shit is. Yeah. Well, you can't, I'm like, God, I'm not trying to, but you're full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the fact that you are so adamant about being full of shit when I'm telling you I was just there is kind of, a, is kind of shocking to me. Yeah. But that seems to be the norm now throughout his throughout all you, of society now yeah, yeah. but uh, it, it was interesting it was it wasn't overly difficult i took a lot of classes i did that rotsy scholarship four-year limit when any of that four and a half five you're getting a degree shit and i wanted to do uh, i wanted to do a triple major they had a program it was uh, uh they had a name for his triple major program and i was going to do political science philosophy and psychology and I couldn't get into the psych classes that were required in time to get it done. So I ended up doing philosophy as a major. Yeah, which is um, fucking hilarious, by the well, way. I mean, Roadhouse is one of my all-time <laughs> favorite movies. And I was a bouncer in college. So fuck you. Um, Pain I, don't hurt. That's right. There's a remake of that coming out, you know. Really? Yeah, with uh, Jake Gyllenhaal, I think. Oh, fuck that movie. I don't know why they got to do it. Fucking I, lack of fucking original thought in well, Hollywood is sad. No, I mean, a agreed. Uh, I do think if, you know, there's a handful of actors that could pull it off, I think Jake can pull it off. Yeah, we'll I, see. I I'll, I'll, watch, I'll have to watch yeah. it, but yeah. yeah. Apparently, I think he's like a, a former UFC fighter turn, you know, gets injured oh, yeah. or something and now is about, you know, something like that, yeah. I, I think, but... I don't yeah, know. it was uh, it was silly easy work to get. Yeah, as a prior seal, like I sure. just fill it out on, the, and they'd be like, "Yeah, you're hired." Yeah, like, but I don't know, like you're you're good. Yeah, yeah. And so I took 21, 24 units a semester, and I worked 40, 60 hours a week as a bouncer, and yeah, that was. So you end up with a uh, a degree in philosophy. Yeah, 
and uh, but no commission strangely yeah strangely enough yeah. uh double minor what uh, happened double double minor um it's it's weird and you're going to be surprised by this you of all people are going to be surprised <laughs> no, no it had something to do with my mouth <laughs> no way uh, it did I don't, I don't uh, buy not it. a lot to do but a, yeah. there was there was a part of it that had to do with my mouth but uh yeah naval science and political science double minor and uh I lost my scholarship because of the requirements of the ROTC scholarship. Uh, they wrote the program in late 60s, early 70s, mm -hmm. when they were transferring from conventional to nuclear Navy. And they wanted you, if you were going to get a commission in the Navy, they wanted you to have a technical degree. So there was a requirement for uh, physics and calculus. And then, so calculus one, calculus two, physics, and then calculus-based physics were those four classes were required for the for the uh uh commissioning or for the you know for the ROTC scholarship program they were required and I could not get through second year calculus I, I wasn't efficient enough at it yeah. I was I, I understood it I could do they, the University of Arizona is a math research university so they wouldn't allow you to use calculators you had to show all your work and I could do three problem sets flawlessly in an hour on a six problem set test and basic math calls that a 50%, which is a fucking <laughs> F. So basic math, <laughs> basic math. Yeah. You failed, but I'm so good. Yeah. But you failed. Yeah. But you're too fucking slow as the thing. Well, and my professor he even went to the, when they were talking about removing my scars, like we need to do something about this. And he went to my CO and my XO. He's like, look, he understands the material, but he's not fast enough. We need to make him faster. And my XO was a Marine Lieutenant Colonel and he was a douche. My CO was a former F-18 pilot Navy, and he was a fucking good guy. I've, I've, I've had some luck with having good officers over the years. Yeah. And he was a good guy, and this, the, the XO was all about, fuck you, get the fuck out of here. And uh, the CO was like, I have it within my power as the CO to let you stay in school. Your, your GPA is good, but you're failing for the, for the ROTC side. So if you can maintain your GPA I, and, and you want to stay and finish your degree. So this was the end of my junior year. Well, early into my second semester, of my junior year. And he said, so if you can do that, I'll let you stay in school. I was like, I appreciate that. Yeah. I'd really like to finish my degree. I'm already here. Yeah. So I had to pay for, I had to pay out of pocket that semester and the next two. And I had to get in state tuition to do that. And there was a whole ball of, but he let me stay and finish my degree. Now, Years in the Navy wise, did that, was that fucking muddied water? Like it, it would have transferred had I finished it and retired. It would have, uh, the, being a ROTC student, you're in active reserves Navy yeah. and it counts, uh, it's uh, two to one. So my four years would have given me two years equivalency active duty I got you. when I retired. So if I'd have gone to 20 years, I could have retired at 22. Yeah. So that's, that's how that math would have worked out. Yeah. So then, what, I mean, when you, so when you graduated and got your degree at that point, um, you could have walked or you had to go. No, no, I, I was committed. I, I owed the Navy the time of college. So I owed them basically three years, okay. three and a half. So, so not, not the, because you paid out of pocket, like it was just the time that it was the time now. that they paid for me. So my first, basically three years of college they I owed. Uh, so what happened then? Uh, so the rule is. And this is, again, needs of the Navy. Navy structure rules. The rule is if you fail out of the program, you go back to your last command at your last command's pay grade. That was the rule. Well, I was in Arizona, so Virginia was along. That's an expensive move. And because I had been in before and I knew guys, I called the detailer in Tennessee. I happened to get a guy on the phone that I'd been at Team 8 with. And uh, I told him, I was like, look, so here's where I'm at. He goes, okay, so you didn't finish. I'm like, no, I finished college. I just didn't get my commission. I got to go back in and list it. And so he pulled up all my shit. He goes, okay, I see where we're at. He says, so what do you want to do? I'm like, well, here's what the rules is. I know what the rules say. What do you want to do? I said, I, I want to be on the, I want to be on the West coast. So my dream sheet when I left buds was to be West coast. And they said, nope, too bad. Fuck you. Yeah. Well, they just commissioned team eight and they, they call it, they, they commissioned it, called it dump eight. Pretty much every command dumped their trouble children at eight. So that's, that's where my start was. And I'd worked with this guy and I told him, I was like, uh, I'd like to go to the West coast to somewhere that's got a similar operational mindset personality as team eight. And he goes, all right, hold on a minute. So he puts fuck like, Hey, what do you guys know about 
both coasts and he asks around and one of the guys says, he says, if you want to go to the West coast and have something similar to eight, you should go to three. So he comes back on the phone. He's like, oh, it looks like team three is a place to go. I was like, well, is there um, orders open for an E5 at team three? He goes, oh, look at that. Orders just came available for an E5 <laughs> at team three. So, you know, big, the good old boy network gets more shit done than any fucking structure ever did. And so he wrote me orders to team three. And then uh, you went straight there, right? Uh, mm, kind of. I had to in process back to active duty. So I was over at... Uh, I was over at the water side at 32nd Street in their, fuck do they call it? Like a holding, temporary, temporary, holding, temporary unit. holding unit, TPU, temporary processing unit. Yeah. Fucking picking up cigarette butts and fucking just, <laughs> Jesus, what the fuck? Na the Navy shit that makes most guys go, you're going to have to kill me to get me out of buds. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I did that for, I don't know, maybe it was probably a month before I was actually at eight. Wow. I got, I got to eight. At three, you mean? Or, yeah, three. I was probably at three in November. Yeah. So I came back. I, I think I started in processing the beginning of October. It was probably mid-November when I was actually at three. Yeah. Did you notice a big shift culture-wise, kind of the way the teams were, so to speak, from that four-year period? Or was it, it kind of? It was, it was significant in a, in a technology yeah. realm. Uh, when I left, GPS was not... It, like like man carried GPS, you know, fucking watched that'll tell you where you are on the planet. That shit didn't exist when I left eight. Yeah, they had uh, they had systems that were big, like old school radio systems. You know, you need a wheelbarrow to roll them around that were doing well. They had systems that you could float and you could float an antenna and get you know fairly accurate stuff. But they didn't have what they had when I came back on active duty. Yeah, is that the biggest difference? Uh, that was one of the big differences. The uh, the move towards more close quarters urban stuff that had already started moving that direction. And I think that was influenced from damn neck guys cycling out of damn neck and bringing that mentality to the rest of the commands. Yeah. So that was, that was a shift. Yeah. But uh, in general, those were probably the two big differences for yeah. the four years out. Yeah. Did you call Tommy Barker and say, hey, I'm coming to three, motherfucker, make me a, a spot? Or did it, was it just total? Happy? I had no idea he was still at three. I had kind of kept in touch. We had, he, he was in the teams. He was deploying. He was doing all manner of shit. And I was in college. And I started doing triathlons in college so that I could stay in shape because I needed something to maintain so that when I got back, so that I could still be an average SEAL. I had to, I had to, I had to maintain my average status. I didn't want to lose yeah. that. And that was pretty important <laughs> to me. And so I, I saw him maybe twice the time I was in college. But when I showed up at three, I don't think I had any idea he was there. I don't know if he knew I was coming. How we ended up in that platoon together, I don't know if he had any. And actually, him and I have never talked about it. I don't know if he had any influence I would in bet that, that he did. He I suspect he did. I would think. but Because he'd been there for a while at that yeah. point. So that, that was. Well, plus the LPO. Like just, right. You know, just yeah. kind of running shit like that. But mm -hmm. uh Fucking wild. So check in the three, uh, you and I meet. Yeah. I, want, I want to hear your version of how you and I met. So the best I remember, you and I met in front of one of the supply mill vans. And I think it was before Christmas that year. It might have been going into January, but I think it was before Christmas of 98. So I got, I came back in October. I was at the team probably early November. So yeah, it was probably because I was slated to go through SQT. I did, I had to do refresher as even as a trident where I'd been out long enough, they wanted me refresher. And there was, uh, there was eight or 10 guys in that class that had tridents that had done other shit. Well, fucking van, yeah. you know, being a nurse, he had to do it. And that's how, that's how him and I met. I was his LPO and SQT, but, uh, I was standing at supply and you were standing at supply and, like, who is this skinny fucking kid? Because <laughs> damn, you were little. You were little like I was little when I came in. I, I mean. I was fucking 19. I know. When I joined the Navy, I weighed 149 pounds. Same here. It was one, yeah, it was 147 was my yeah, first ID. Like, fuck. Yeah. And uh, n I don't know that I'd want to be that small again, but I wouldn't mind being 10 pounds smaller yeah. if it didn't take so much work now. But yeah. Uh, yeah, the, uh, it was the mill vans behind the command because it was a small command and they didn't have all the storage they needed. And so they had uh, the Vidmar cabinets right there at the beginning with little stuff in yeah. the drawers. And I sent the supply guy to the back of the mill van to get me something that I needed. 
And I started opening drawers and handing the shit out. And you're like, what the fuck is this guy doing? I'm like, you need to steal everything you can from supply because <laughs> these motherfuckers won't give you shit if you ask for it because they don't want to. Yeah. They think it's theirs. Yeah. And that was, uh, that was our first meeting as far as I know. That's pretty fucking accurate. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was like, you know, brand new, bushy-tailed, like had just checked in. And, and I'm the old salty. Yeah, you're this old salty <laughs> fuck that, you know, has been on the East Coast. Who and, still doesn't feel like I have any. Yeah, but yeah, that's exactly right. I was standing there with my fucking kit bag mm -hmm. waiting for my G-Shock and, you know, the handful yeah. of other things that they were going to issue. And, and I like, handed you a Leatherman and some yeah, other I mean, shit. Fucking, <laughs> 550 cord and riggers tape and steal everything kind, you can from these motherfuckers and of course i'm just like i don't think we're oh, supposed no, we're to do this to. you <laughs> can't touch that stone like fuck that just yeah. take it put it yeah. in your bag shut the fuck up but i'm like the supply guy's there this guy's an, an old guy that's been around i guess i should listen to him and i just yeah fucking mm -hmm. you know peer pressure i guess yeah. you know but uh a sea daddy shit yeah the uh all right so then, then uh, you go through SQT, get into the platoon, end up with Tom Barker, end up with me and, and a host of other new guys, including Glenn. Um, you know, I've I've kind of detailed our experience at, at Team Three platoon wise, so I won't uh, go, I guess, too heavy into it. Other than just you kind of you kinda glossed over me cutting my oh yeah SQT, I guess yeah, my yeah. my SQT. So one, one I the, thought surely you were going to well. Wanna. So one of the challenges of, of interviewing somebody that I know so well is is that there's a lot of things that I just wouldn't normally think about. Right. It's it's interesting trying to interview you because there's yeah there's just things that uh, that are different. Yeah. But so yeah, going through SQT, I mean, you almost fucking killed yourself, really. I, I, mean, I did. Like, yeah, I came really close because I'm a fucking retard and I like yeah, knives. The, um, the femoral artery, like, was right there. Yeah, right? I uh, so. At eight, when I got there, they were issuing the Buckmaster from the original Rambo movie. Yeah. You know, with the little grappling hooks and yeah. fucking thread in and fucking compass on the butt of the yeah, and, and, and the hollow handle. And yeah. and all things considered, the knife's actually a decent knife. It's a really heavy bladed deal uh, from Buck. Uh, probably five sixteenths thick, like a really beefy fucking blade where they put the little bitty saw blade that's yeah. fucking useless. But it had a really uh, a really fragile tip. About three eighths to a half an inch of the tip was super fragile because of the grind lines that they put on it, which you can relate to having a super fragile tip. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, no, my tip is bulbous <laughs> and very durable. Um, yeah, go ahead and put that in your fucking mental imagery bank. Uh, if you broke the tip off and reground it, it was actually a really durable knife and I still have it. I used it as a demo knife for fucking most of my career. Oh shit. Cause it was a super durable knife. You just beat the living shit out of it. Once that tip was broken off and reshaped. Like you still have it. I still have it. Oh, yeah. Shit. Yeah. I still have it. And, uh, so we were, we were at a demo range. We were fuck, towards the end of SQT. We were coming up on the 12 mile hump part. So that's like the last month or so, something like that. Yeah. And, uh, we we're doing demo. And I was opening a couple of, it was opening cases of deck cord and they're just, you know, wooden banded boxes, but they had a metal band around them. And I had this fucking buck mask and I was like, Fuck, just get out of them. Cause guys were trying to figure out how to open them with their fucking leathermen trying to get their, you know, their wire cutters and I'm like, just get the fuck out of the way. So I'm wedging this knife under these bands and prying it up. And so I popped two, I think it was on the third one in vans right there. And I popped it. And when I popped it, I fucking hit I, my head. I hit myself in the leg. I'm like, fuck, I almost cut myself. And Van's looking at my leg. He's like, you might want to plug that up. You're going to bleed to death. And I look down and my legs, I'm just fucking pouring blood out of my leg. And so I'm like, oh, fuck. So I stick two fingers in it and fucking gimp off. The whole class was watching, you know, this old fucking team guy be a fucking <laughs> retard. I fucking stabbed myself. My own, all my, all my worst injuries are self-inflicted, turns out. And uh, so, yeah, I, I missed. It, it went in in an upward angle. Let me move this so yeah. I don't fuck it up. There's the headphones. Yeah, see? So uh, it went in at an upward angle <laughs> into, my, into my thigh, and it missed. By measurement, they say it missed my femoral artery by probably a millimeter and a half. Jeez. So the thickness of a dime, I missed puncturing my femoral artery. And we were... We were like siphon 16. We were way the fuck out. We were, we were 35 minutes from the base yeah. and another hour to a hospital. Yeah. And so, yeah, I probably came really close to fucking bleeding out. Even, I mean, I pro they probably could have tourniqueted me and kept me, from, but I, yeah, I fucking yeah. just. And, it, and of course, they didn't clean it well, the guy. Disney. Walt Disney. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
no, no, no bag on him for it, but he missed shit in the wound because it was so deep. It was two layers of sutures, muscle layer, skin layer, and there was shit in there, so it got infected. And I had to dry pack it for like six months. God damn. Now it looks like a gunshot wound. It, I mean, it looks super cool, but it's just dumb as fuck. The reason yeah. I have it. Yeah. The scar's awesome, but yeah. Well, the, I mean, that put you out. There was a lot of training that you couldn't do because of it too, right? I mean, well, yeah, I, I didn't do the hump because I couldn't. Um, I could I could wing all the rest of it. And it was, for me, it was a refresher anyway. And I'd done all of the base shit, up, you know, including, you know, sh- showing Walt Disney that GPS is not the end all be all in fucking navigation. And that was talking about the differences, like that attitude of what is necessary to do the job. I was sad to learn that uh, the guys at his era, and he was well below, well behind me in classes as well, that technology had become a crutch, yeah. and I didn't like it. And uh, he wanted me to fucking navigate with a GPS, and I told him, I said, if you can ever show me with your GPS that I'm not where I say I am with my map and compass, we'll talk. But until that point, I said, I can break your GPS, and you know where the fuck you are because you're an idiot. And we went round and round and round about that particular topic. And Van and I talked about it. And he's like, I learned the way you learned, but this is new. I'm like, I'm not doing the new shit. And so because of that, you know, I ended up being the point man for two platoons. And yeah. I always did it with a map and compass because it made sense to me. That's the way I learned it. Yeah. I mean, that's one thing I, I remember and will always remember uh, your sense of direction, like just natural. Was it always good? Because it's, yeah, just for, like as long as I can up, ever remember. Yeah. Because I mean, that's one thing like. You know, obviously, every point man of every platoon should should be, yeah, ideally inclined naturally to, to have a decent sense <laughs> yeah, of direction. But uh, but I, I I mean, there were times where I would say I was embarrassed at how fucking lost I I was really? in terms of where we were. Now, granted, some of it was I'm at the very other end, right? The, you know, pulling rear security, which you could argue I should probably have paid more right. attention because sometimes you can wind up being the point man, but like I, I, I kind of intentionally was not really paying attention because you were so good at. It. I was yeah. like, dude, he's fucking. You know, yeah, he knows where we're going. He'll fucking. Like, he'll drive us. What if he gets go. shot? <laughs> you know, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, like times at Fort Chaffee, or you know, where we would fly around in a helicopter for fucking an hour. You right. know, and not just doing circles where it's like you can kind of. I mean, going no, doing, every other doing which cold God, drops and yeah, you know, yeah, you know, and and we'd land and fucking get out and do our you know look, listen, fucking wait, whatever the fucking acronym. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, another I one of those that I can't remember. Um, you know, but you know, and I'm thinking to myself like, dude, we could be in fucking Kentucky and I wouldn't know any different. Right. And, uh, and you're like, yep, we're right here, you know? And then, <laughs> and then Van would pull out the, G, you know, other guys would grab their GPS and be like, yeah, that's right where we're at. I'm like, how in the fuck? Yeah. I don't, I don't know. But you know, to me, even, even stroking your ego a, a little further, you like you can stroke whatever you want to yeah, mind. That's what I'm talking about. We're going to need to take a quick break. Uh, it's not going to be that quick. Yeah, it, it won't. It'll be short for the audience. <laughs> <laughs> It'll seem like the blink of an eye four hours later. Uh, no, but like even in Iraq, similarly, like there right. there is no maps. You know, it's, oh. it's like you just knew where the fuck we were. And, right. and it's not like. Well, I had maps. I mean. Yeah, but I mean, the, but the way that the streets are. Right. It's yeah. like Boston versus Washington, D.C. Right, yeah. It's like, yeah. you know, you go. Like One you, is here's how you navigate and the other one's fuck you figure it yeah, out. It's yeah. like on purpose trying mm-hmm. to trick fuck you, you know, and. uh yeah, I'm I, I just like, dude, I have no fucking idea where we're at. And, and you're fucking driving right through, you know, just always knew right, right. the fuck where we were, yeah. where we were supposed to be. Uh, I mean, I, I've, I, I wouldn't say that I'm terrible with directions, but, you know, in, any competency that I have is, is from years of being in the SEAL teams of having to, right. to learn and, and figure out and whatever. I, I would not say that I just have a good natural sense of direction the way that you do. Uh, and, and the other part of that is I always wanted to be a point man. Like yeah. that was my dream job in the teams. And I started as a radio man and then I was a 60 gunner. And then I finally got to be a point man. And I think that helped as well. I think, uh, I think too many guys get to be point man without carrying a heavy load. Yeah. Because, you know, they have a natural proclivity or they show that and then they, and they beat the fuck out of their guys because they don't understand what it means to carry that extra load. Yeah. And so I always wanted to be a point man so I could be the light guy out front. I just, that was my dream job in the teams. And so when I finally got it, I was just ecstatic. Yeah. And, well, and, I, and I wanted to be it, and maybe that helped, yeah. you know, be, be 
professional at it, but I always had, I've always had a natural sense. Yeah. No, for, for sure. some reason. Yeah. No, I mean, it was always, always mind numbing. Um, do any stories stand out, uh, during our two platoons together that, uh, that, that you remember or that you think fondly of that you want to share? <laughs> the, the Abbotee story. Yeah. I can <laughs> set it up. Uh, so Fort Chaffee, two platoons after we, uh, after we road tripped from San Diego to, uh, to, to Arkansas. Jesus. In a fucking bluebird bus. In a bluebird bus. Holy shit. What a fucking shit show. Oh, yeah. we can't afford to get a plane. Wow. Yeah. Thanks. Tip of the spear. Nothing but, nothing but the finest for my boys. Yeah. So uh, we're doing, you know, two platoons worth of land warfare training at Fort Chaffee. And uh, now I've been point man for Van because I was his point man in our platoon in SQT. And then he ended up being the AOIC of that first platoon and then the OIC of the second. And so I just stayed in that point man position. He liked me there and we were comfortable. We were, we were good together and he trusted me to make the right decisions. And so we were doing this, um, it's the, the charges off of the, the GTA card, the, uh, I think it's an army general explosives, you know, a little fold out, um, fourfold, I think of just general explosive charges that have worked throughout explosives history but the the thing is written in tnt numbers so all of the charges are based off of the tnt explosive Explosive. weight weight and and brissons yeah so if you're doing any of those charges with modern explosives you have to do math to convert from one to the other to do to use the proper amount of explosives to make it work and the, uh, the Abatee charge on that card, is, it, it, it's a tree-cutting charge, and it's designed to knock a tree down over a road to impede traffic. Without impede completely Motor traffic, it. right, to, to kick it so it breaks it enough to fall over on the road, but it maintains on the stump at about five, six foot, so it can't be driven over easily. Yeah. So it's anchored on one edge. And two platoons... We were broken up into like four, four groups man each. groups. Yeah. So I think it was four man groups. So I think it was four. So yeah, it was eight, four man groups. Yeah. And like four or five groups had just failed fucking miserably at it. And I was wearing that, uh, fucking Barma Australian, Australian kangaroo fucking kangaroo hat. hat. <laughs> Cause I hated the fucking helmets and, yeah. and, and because we'd done our fucking, we'd done homework. They'd done those fucking ballistic helmets. Don't stop a single round that is fired at you. Yeah. And they impede your vision. They impede your hearing. They're nice for mounting nods. But aside from that, they're just a fucking uncomfortable piece of shit. And I didn't like wearing them. Yeah. So I was wearing that hat. And the, the uh, training cadre was just fucking infuriated that I wore that hat. <laughs> and Van kind of was backing me. He's like, he's my guy. Fucking leave him be. It's not hurting nothing. It's my guy, whatever. And so for whatever reason, on that range, it came to a head. And they're like, that fucking hat. And Van comes to me. He says, you can, can you do this charge? I was like, fuck yeah, I can do this charge. He's like, everybody else is failing. I was like, I'll do the fucking charge. And so Van tells me, he says, I'll make a bet with you. He says, if you can do this charge correctly, I will defend that hat to anybody in our chain of command up to the fucking president of the United States. Yeah. If you fuck it up, and we'd been on MREs for like a week. He says, if you fuck it up, I get to shit in that hat and you wear it for 24 <laughs> hours. That was the bet. <laughs> and he made that, and we made that bet in front of two fucking platoons. So yeah. if I fucking failed, I was going to wear that hat taped to my head if I didn't want to. Oh, fuck. And so I was like, yeah, fuck it. I'll take the bet. And so I did, and I did the math, and my charge was different than everybody else's. And Van's like, oh. Like, there was part of him, I think even then, there was part of him, he's like, man, I hope he fucks this up just so I can fucking hold him, <laughs> just so I can fucking shut him up for a minute. And it was, and it was done, and it was correct. Yeah. And so I wore that fucking hat the rest of the time we, were, we yeah. worked together. Yeah, I mean, even in Iraq, I remember. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've got pictures of us fucking standing there, you wearing that goddamn hat. Mattis actually asked him about it. Oh, when right. we were doing that NAV plan out of Iraq, like, hey, what the fuck's the deal with your guy not being Vans? Like, he's my guy. Don't fucking worry about him. Yeah. Like, and, and he did to his credit. He's like, I told you yeah. all the way. I don't give a shit. And he did. Yeah. So. God, that's awesome. <laughs> and then I crashed and burned on that O course and broke both arms. Yeah. And you took the opportunity to fuck with me. I mean, horribly. As I should have. Fucking bully. Uh, I, you know, I, I feel like it's a bit of a misrepresentation. No, it's pretty accurate. <laughs>